Welcome to Mission Control, a podcast focusing on executive directors and nonprofit leaders and how they strive to make positive impacts in their community. I'm your host, Paul Schmidt, owner and creative video strategist for Unidus Multimedia, and I would like to welcome as my guest today, Julie Thomasma from Child and Family Charities. How are you doing, Julie? Hey, Paul. Thanks for having me today. I'm doing great. Well, Well, I'm glad you're doing great. That's awesome. The first thing that I'd like to start with is talking about what is the mission of Child and Family Charities? Okay, well, Child and Family Charities' mission is to evolve and change with the changing needs of the community. So I love our mission because it gives us lots of flexibility to be able to address community needs as they arise. And this time, I'll tell you, it's really, it's been an honor to be able to lead this mission because we've seen so much change in the last couple of years of what the needs have been. And the pandemic has just highlighted so many of the things that we were we already knew were going on in the community, but we're seeing them in a different light. And I think it's also brought others to recognize, you know, some of the needs in the community as well. Yeah, that's very true. That's very, very true. Um, but before we get into the pandemic stuff, I'm going to take it back a little yeah, bit. Sure. So you arrived here. When I say here in Lansing, Michigan, working for CFC, not that long ago, just a few years back. Well, it, it's actually been six years. Mm-hmm. And I only know that because it did go very fast because my youngest daughter is six years old. And I applied when she was a week old because I wanted to come home here back to Michigan. And we were living in Chicago at the time. And it was my second child. And we were like, OK, we it's time to set up you know, our roots and settle in somewhere. And I saw the job posting for child and family charities and went for it then and interviewed when she was about a month old. So that's kind of my marker in time, kind of knowing how long I've been here and with the agency. That's really cool. I didn't even, I don't know if I knew that. I knew you had a young, young daughter, but I didn't realize that it was like, it coincided. Yes, very much so. It, you know, and what's cool too, is the mission here fits so well with, you know, I, I'm raising my own children and I just, you know, I get to live out that mission here too, making sure that we're caring for children. That's really cool segue because it really goes into what I wanted to ask you first. I mean, why did you feel that you were a good fit for CFC? What was, when I say CFC, child and family charities, you know, coming from, I believe you were in Chicago. Um, Mm -hmm. at the time going, you know, laddering from Chicago into this area. Why did you think that, what what stuck out about this position for you? Well, it definitely was the work with children. And I wouldn't say that was always the case. My journey has kind of taken me in so many different directions. Um, I'm actually trained as a clinical psychologist. And so I did some work with children when I was in training and thought, I don't know if that's what I want to do ever is work with kids because it pulled on my heart so much. But um, then after having kids, I I think I just saw this mission in a different light. And I think you just realize that you want every kid to have the same opportunities and you you just, my heart just kind of went straight, you know, straight into the work. So that, you know, I shifted gears. I was in Chicago. I was working with people with disabilities and I, I love that mission and I never thought I would leave that type of work. But like I said, after having kids, I think it was an easy transition. And this mission has been absolutely incredible because we do such great work in the community. So I have no problem getting behind it every single day. <laughs> nice. So what, was, what did you find the most interesting part of joining this staff? What, was, what stuck out? Uh, I think, you know, everybody was just so genuine, transparent. I'm just really cared. So even when I met the board, I met the leadership team before I came here, I just thought everybody was real. They're in it. They're in it for all the right reasons. They care about the community. Everybody wanted to see positive impact in the community. So to me, it was just an easy, easy yes to come back home. (laughs) That's awesome. You come back home. So when you say come back home, so you're originally from the area. 
or nearby? I'm from Brighton. Yeah, I'm from Brighton, but then I went to Ann Arbor for school. E, sorry. <laughs> Go blue. Uh, I never would have thought. This is what I've learned in life, too. Never say never, because I never would have thought I would land in the Lansing area, just given that I never really ventured this way. I wasn't an MSU person. But after you know settling in, meeting the people here, I just I never want to leave. I love it. Well, let's, let's talk about that. What, what, I mean, talk about that, the community a little bit and what you're really, um, seeing with this, with the community that you're working with day in, day out. What's really, you know, you mentioned it, it tugging at your heartstrings for the work that you do and the work that the organization does, but talk about the community, talk about how they make you feel. Oh, well, you know, our mission, it, we have such a deep reach in so many different areas. And so the, our breadth of our mission is incredible. Um, but I think, you know, most recently with the community needs and what we've been seeing, I mean, with the pandemic, it really highlighted, like I said, a lot of the needs that were already there. Um, but I think it helped us like kind of just get in a little bit deeper of like, how can we help? We're, what can we do? Um, so for us, it was... You know, we saw the increase in violence in the community and the needs there. A lot of young people being involved in violence. And we know that young people are part of families. And so there's a lot going on with families, um, the risk factors for so many of the families here in Lansing. Um, we saw a lot of mental health needs. And, I, you know, that's a passion of mine, wanting to help people who have been through different things, kids who have been through trauma. Um, you know, we, the needs with not having eyes on kids. I mean, we that was a whole nother thing that we've seen lately with the pandemic is, you know, when kids weren't coming to school, we knew that there were still a lot of kids that were in tough situations, but we weren't able to put, you know, mandated reporters and people who they'd normally be connecting with, we weren't able to put our eyes on them. So we really had to think about how can we connect with families? How can we connect with kids? and just our community in a different way. And so the way we did that is every time somebody would come to us on Facebook or just outreach to us in any way, I was like, we got to figure out a way to say yes and keep interacting with the community. We might not be getting the referrals in our traditional way, like through the schools, but hey, when we see somebody on Facebook saying, hey, I have a need or I don't have food in the house, let's make it happen. And so that's a lot of how we started shifting and interfacing with the community in a different way. In but the, so many needs, I mean, happening right now, and it's it has not been easy. It has not been an easy time for so many people. Right. And I know that you mentioned that you met with the leadership of the organization as well as the board. Well, how, and then you're talking about all the cool things, I shouldn't say just cool, but important, imperative, awesome things that you're doing within the community. But how? Um, how, what was the best way for you to integrate yourself um, gradually into the community? What, what were mm -hmm. some of the ways that you, <clears throat> you did, you know, you were able to find your footing um, uh, in, the, in the community? Sure. Well, it's kind of twofold. Well, first, I dove into our programs, and I made sure that I shadowed all the different leaders, um, our staff, I went out with our street team and actually did, I went out in the van and just said, okay, show me homelessness for youth. Show me what that looks like. And went out to the different clinics, to the different adult shelters and saw how youth were interfacing and, you know, in those situations and how we could get them in, over to our shelter. So I, I went out and actually saw the work. I did shifts at Angel House. Uh, the staff kind of loved it because I could see what their challenges were, how difficult it was to you know, do some of the things that they were asked to do. And I was able to see all that firsthand. Um, I made sure that I was in the clinics. I was asking questions, trying to understand the work. So that was kind of my first dive is just making sure I understood everything that we were doing and the nuances of that. And then in terms of getting to know the community from a social perspective, I just felt like I went to everything I possibly could, especially, you know, that was a lot easier back then. Um, going to, you know, Rotary, I was exchange club, 
any kind of networking event I try to go to and just put ourselves out there and making sure that people knew what we were doing in the community. So, and I felt so embraced that, I mean, that's the best thing about Lansing is people will say, Hey, come and meet with me for a cup of coffee. Hey, you need to meet so-and-so. I mean, everybody wants to help. Everybody wants to see this community, you know, improve. They want to see a bright future for kids. I mean, everybody's invested and it was just easy to feel very welcomed and embraced here. Was there, you know, going through the programs and, and seeing your team um, with their boots on the ground doing, you know, <laughs> understanding what they're doing. W- was there any, was any point of that, like, excuse me, was, at any point, was, it, was any of that intimidating? How did you feel? No, I loved it. I mean, I loved everything that we're doing. Um, I mean, especially with my background, and I think I, you know, I I can relate so much to the staff, and I'm so thankful I had that background because I know what they're going through. I know what the challenges are, um, but getting to see exactly how we are doing it or exactly the types of programs that we had was really important. Um, but you know, nothing was intimidating. The staff are fabulous here. I mean, everybody's dedicated. We have a lot of long-term staff in leadership and the long-term staff that have been with us for years doing work in child welfare, work with um, our street team. I mean, they're, they're dedicated. They want, they want to see positive change in the community. I really think that's what you did about diving into the programs, I think was really key. Do you think, um, was that something that maybe a colleague of yours mentioned you should do, or was it that just instinctual? I think I just wanted to do it so I could get to know everybody. Yeah. I mean, I, I just kind of dove in as fast as I could when I got here because I just felt like it was the only way to go. It was the only way to get to know everything. I, I mean, I think that's great. And do you feel like other um, executive directors should do the same thing? Do you think that how important would that be? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's so important to be relatable to our staff and so that they really understand that we understand. Um, you know, I think at any point, I have a very open door policy. And I think people do know that I know the programs, I know what they're going through. So I think it just makes you that much more relatable. And then also, that gives you a voice so you can advocate when you're in the community for funding or whatever that program might need. So, or partnerships too. Right. Hi. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no problem. Um, go ahead and interrupt. This is your show. Yours is your show. So <laughs> that's okay. Hey, uh, well, when you came in as ED, um, what was one skill that you wanted to flesh out that you wanted to get better at that you thought, you know what, if I'm going to come into this role, um, here's, here's something that I really think I should work on. Okay. Well, I think, you know, I'm a, I'm naturally an introvert that's paid to be an extrovert. So <laughs> <laughs> in so many ways. And so I think for me, I've really had to kind of come into my own and finding my voice and voice for the agency and way to articulate our story. And that's been definitely a challenge for me. Um, but I, I, I mean, I take on the challenge every day and I'll, I'll definitely welcome it because I believe in the mission and want to make sure that I'm always kind of pushing myself to be better and tell our story in the best way possible. That's great. So what do you feel was your biggest success prior to the pandemic? Like you're, you this is, let's say 2016 to 2019. What was, what was one of the biggest successes that you're really proud of? Hmm. Well, that's a good question, Paul. So, you know, and I think this will kind of all lead into what, you know, some of the things that we're going to talk about, but when I came into the agency, it was really important for me to set a strong strategic plan. I love planning the work, working the plan. And there was a big push when I came in to like immediately jump into a capital campaign or replace our buildings, our shelter. And I said, hold. We have to hold because I don't know if we're ready. And that first year when I was here, we did a deep dive in talking to all of our community partners, did surveys, talked to staff, key stakeholders. 
and just try to understand how we were interfacing with the community and how people understood our services. And I found that we had a lot of work to do. And so I felt like in terms of people just knowing who we were, we've been in the community for 110 years plus, and a lot of people didn't know who we were. And I found that you know, and trying to meet people, they were like, oh, huh? What, you know, what, what do you guys do? I had no idea. I had no idea you did so much. I had no idea you have 28 programs. So I think that first strategic plan where we really honed in on marketing, telling our story in a different way, um, financial stability, all of those key things that got us ready to where we are at this point in time um, was probably, and, and we pushed it forward and we hit all the markers. I mean, everything that we set forth in that strategic plan, we hit and, and exceeded. And if we hadn't been able to do that, then we wouldn't be ready to do the work that we're doing right now. So what was uh, one major thing that you learned about yourself during that first first part of prior to the pandemic? What was one thing that you were like, Okay, this this was a really cool aspect of my growth. <laughs> um, I don't give up easily. I'm pretty competitive. I don't give up, and I I don't think that's changed. So I mean, there's there's a lot. Of, you know, there's always setbacks, right? And I don't think I give up. I keep working the plan. I stick to it. Um, so I think I saw that before the pandemic, and I think I still see that now. You know, just keep going. So what were what was it like for you when the pandemic hit and you there was a pause and then obviously a scramble to get restarted what was I mean because like you said you don't give up easily so yeah. how did you not give up at the very start of the pandemic Well Paul, I wouldn't even say there was a pause we didn't really pause. I mean, we had no choice. We had to keep going forward because, I mean, we have kids with us who are in, you know, the foster care system. We operate two, we have a shelter and then we have Angel House, two residential programs. Those are 24 seven operations. So we didn't really have a, a choice to really pause. We just kept going. Um, our strategic plan had prepared us pretty well at that point because we had just invested in technology upgrades uh, we were working on remote work policies. We were kind of ready to go. So we essentially just ripped off that Band-Aid and went. And our staff were awesome. They adjusted quickly. Everybody was just all in. Um, like I said, we started adjusting some of our services, but people, our staff were fabulous about that. I mean, they're like, okay, well, I can't do this part of my job the way I used to do it, but I think I can do it this way. And people just adjusted. We made sure kids were safe. Um, and they kept going. Wow. So with that, because you're a nonprofit and a lot of your funds come through donor or sponsor dollars. So talk about the fundraising aspects. Now you have an annual event that happens every year. That's huge. So yes. talk about how did you fundraise well through the pandemic and um, how did the how how did that affect your your annual event? Mm -hmm. well, we made a commitment to make sure we were communicating what we were doing consistently throughout the the pandemic. So every day we were posting something on social media. I think we increased our social media following quite a bit during that time. We just made sure we were just telling our story, letting people know we were here doing the work. And so I think that really helped. We stayed connected with our donors. Uh, we made a lot of calls talked to a lot of people. I checked in on donors. How are you doing? I mean, we're all struggling through this. I think that was key, just maintaining that constant communication. And then when it came to the Red Nose, which is our big event that we have in December, um, it became pretty obvious we weren't going to be able to have that. I think at the time, uh, the newest order of lockdowns went in and it wasn't even an option to get people together at that time. And we were able to do the entire event virtually and had a wonderful successful year. And even this next year, we did a hybrid event this next last year. And that one was our all time best event that we've ever had. So I think just maintaining that communication with our donors the entire time helped us get through that and kept the engagement. It's amazing. It's amazing how much communication and just 
doing those touch points are so important because uh, that's that's where you know where you're you're relying on, and so you're relying on these folks, and so to be able to open that communication and make them part of that story. I, I think yeah, I mean, our mission is is driven by the community. It belongs to the community. I believe that all nonprofits belong to their community. So I think just letting people know what their nonprofit was doing and how we kept helping people during this time was so important. Nice. Now, another big thing, speaking of big things, is uh, you did a merger in a pandemic year. I know that's Always going to have the the apostrophe or whatever the quotes <laughs> around it. Pandemic year, but I mean, how did this happen? And what was this pr- whole process of developing this and getting this off the ground? I know that it was a lot of work. So it was because you're part of it too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, child and family, we've we're pretty good at mergers. We we've done several mergers prior to this one, so I think we had a great track record and knew what to do. And um, really knew how to keep, make sure that we kept their mission front and center. Um, So we merged with Child and Family Services, which some people think is us anyways. It's our, it was our parent organization. But the main program that they did was Operation Good Cheer, which is a program that has been in the community for 50, 50 years, um, delivering boss or making sure that donors were tied to um, foster kids throughout the whole state of Michigan. So every year that they partner to provide gifts for about 6,700 kids, it's an incredible mission. Um, so, you know, obviously it fit right into our work. So it just made a lot of sense. Um, we had actually originally responded, they had put on RFP to merge because I think they recognize the need to support their back office. They wanted to be able to make sure that their mission lived on. Um, they have a very small staff. They had a staff of one, <laughs> one, one and a half, one, two, you know, to, to complete this mission. And they just wanted to make sure they had all the right su- supports in place to be able to grow and thrive into the future. So I think for them, you know, they were ready. And then our organization already had a wonderful relationship with them. And I think that's a lot of the key when you're looking at mergers, moving these forward is looking, looking at how your values align, looking at how your cultures align. But, you know, we already have a track record of working together. So it's kind of just was more of the formality of, you know, all right, come, come on, come under our umbrella. So um, it, didn't, it didn't happen without a lot of challenges, though. Like you said, during a pandemic and trying to work with the IRS and all the paperwork that has to happen with offices closed and everything else. But it happened and um, we're thrilled. We had, a, you know, we we're able to bring them in right before the holiday season so we were able to have our first Operation Good Cheer um, with them under our umbrella last year. Yeah, I thought that was, uh, <laughs> it was interesting to listen to the conversations about how how that was going well. And then, you know, it was, just, <laughs> yeah, it was, but I mean, it all, it all worked out in the end and it went, it went through and everything was great. And so, um so yeah, it was really, really cool to see, uh, see that journey. But now, since we were talking about your initial strategic plan, yes. now we have, and you mentioned something big that people wanted to do then, now it's time. And that's yes. your capital campaign that's coming up. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, I know that you can't get into the weeds or, you know, can't get yeah. into too many, too many details, but just, just. Uh, tell us how excited you are and what's going on. And yeah, well, it's all... it's been like the most incredible journey. I mean, it's so much has happened even within the last year. And so, um, yeah, as part of our strategic plan, our first one I had six years ago, we um, by the end of that strategic plan, that three year cycle, we started putting together a committee, capacity building committee, to work on this to find a new property for our shelter and for all of our services um, here, which currently we're located at Jolly and Dunkel. And, but we've outgrown our building. And then, like I said, we've been, we have all these small mergers and people have come under our umbrella and we just outgrew our space. And so we started renting across the parking lot. We're in Bethlehem church. 
we have a shelter across town. We're like, okay, it's, we would really love to bring all these services under one umbrella. So I'm um, planning for this started a long time ago because um, we had to do a lot of things to get us ready for this. But, um, and then the capacity building committee had to find a place. Oh my goodness. We have seen so many places throughout all of Lansing. I think we've toured every vacant school, every vacant building that had potential. And we were looking for a lot of square footage, but kind of this about 50,000 square feet, but kind of this sweet spot where it was like we are too big, too small um, type of situation for so many of the different sites we were looking at. So um, last year we were contacted by McLaren because they have built this beautiful new hospital and um, they said, hey, we need to repurpose our Green Lawn campus and wanted to know if we'd be interested in their McCree house, which is kind of like their hospitality house where they have patients who stay long term or residents that use that for our shelter. Because that was our priority. That kind of was what really pushed us to start, get this going because our shelter is so well loved and it's not accessible. And it just needed, it needed to be replaced. So we went over to the McCree house, fell in love with the building. It is 12,000 square feet. It's amazing. It has 14 bedrooms, 17 bathrooms. It is a dream. And so we got over there. I mean, everybody was just so amazingly excited. I mean, we're all like, okay, how do we make this happen? And then as we're over there, we start having conversations that, you know, there's other parts of their campus that we could use right across the street. There's an educational center that we could use for a youth drop-in center. And then they had their admin and their professional buildings, the Merriman Center right there too, that kind of hit that mark. It was, you know, 45,000 square feet. It was perfect. So that kind of started our journey. And that was just about a year ago. So I can tell you a lot has happened in that time. Uh, we have kind of a great deal going forward with McLaren, working through the details of that property, our piece of that property, I should say, because that's kind of a part of a bigger plan for McLaren. We have just one part of that campus and the remaining part of the campus, they're looking for other partners to come in and working with community mental health to try to bring some much needed services to the area too. Um, so like I said, that particular location checked every box. It's in an area that we're already serving in South Lansing. It's on a bus line. It's in a neighborhood. It is perfect. So now, okay, how much does it cost? <laughs> <laughs> we, that was the next part. So like I said, we had this amazing committee. Um, we had um, an architect on it, realtor, all of our board, awesome board members. And we were able to come up with some estimates pretty quickly of what we'd need to do to renovate the space to make it our own. And we're looking at a $7 million project. So at first, okay, take a deep breath. Can we do this? Um, we started doing all the normal things like feasibility studies and making sure that we could plow forward with this plan. I mean, because all of a sudden this, you know, this dream is, it's, it's a big one. I mean, this is a big project, but McLaren gave us the great advice to start talking to legislators and seeing if there was any recovery money that, that could help us with this project. I'm um, just given everything that our mission does. I mean, it just makes perfect sense. We're addressing so many of the things of the needs of, that have come up with the pandemic that, you know, it seemed worth at least an education and an ask to see what kind of funding might be available. So that was kind of our first step, Paul. So we found the place and then we had to figure out how are we going to, how are we going to pay for it? And so I have good, pro I have good news there too. I have, we've made great progress. <laughs> We've made amazing progress. So I can say like over the summer, we met with everybody who would talk to me, every legislator. They all know me now. I think they knew me a little bit, but now they really know me. <laughs> and they just love the project because it, you know, it's kind of twofold. Like it's repurposing an old building, but it's also giving us the ability to grow and address a lot of the needs that are out there. And so I found out right after the budget passed, the state budget passed, that we were written in for a million dollars. Um, incredible. It was incredible news. And I think that was like, that was the excitement, the spark that like, okay, we, we can do this. I mean, this is going to happen. And so they were our first investors. And then we went back to, we had been talking to Ingham County. We went back to the County and we just, we asked them for 
consideration of $3 million in the, in the project. And they came in this fall with a $3 million match for us. Mm. So, yeah. So all of a sudden, okay, we're up to 4 million. I mean, I have to find the other three, but Hey, we're, we're really making some progress. And then Jackson national life insurance. I mean, they've been a longtime partner and have walked alongside with us for our mission. I mean, for a long time, for nearly a decade and they had, you know, volunteers who have been in our shelter, and they're very much invested in the shelter program. And they came in and said, you know, we want to fund the entire shelter, all the renovations that are needed, everything you need. So they came in at 940000 mm-hmm. uh, in December. So we're well on our way, Paul. And we, you know, we started talking to foundations and just letting them know what our vision is, what we want to accomplish. And it has been so well received. So, yeah. So we can't wait to, you know, right now we're in the position of going public and starting to talk to the community about raising this last little bit of dollars that we can match with Ingham County, Ingham County funds and make this big dream a reality. Cool. That's, that's great. So with all that, what that's been going on mergers and, big time fundraising, big time this and capital campaigns. My last question for you, what do you do to decompress, to escape for a little bit, to, to, you know, just to have some you time? That's a great question. Well, you know, I love spending time with my kids. I mean, they're my, they're my priority and they bring me so much happiness and joy. And yeah. So like, you know, running in the snow, going playing outside, anything we can. We we get out on the boat a lot during the summer. I mean, we're just always outside just trying to decompress and have fun. I really don't separate work from my personal life, I'll be honest. <laughs> I don't. I don't find it works well for me. I just think they blend anyways. Yeah. So, hey, I just embrace it and I don't fight it. I just am like, hey, you know, it's all one. Exactly. Well, thank you very much for being on the program, Julie. Really appreciate it. And if anybody wants to know exactly what's going on with Child and Family Charities, what's the best way for them to find out? Well, we definitely keep things current on our Facebook um, and website. You can just even just give me a call. I'm pretty easy to reach. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, that's that's great. So thank you again, Julie, for coming on. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Paul. No problem. And thank you all again for taking some time to listen to the program. So don't miss the next episode coming out in a couple of weeks. And if there's someone you know of that you would like to hear about in their journey, please email us at missioncontrol at introduce.com. And if this is your first time here, please subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcasting platform and give us a positive review. Thank you all again and see you next time in the Control Center.